Apologies that I can't be with you in person today, but I hope you find this talk about AMR and specifically what are we doing about it of interest. For the sake of completeness, I've included here my potential conflicts of interest, although I'd like to believe that none of these are relevant to what I have to say today. I'm going to split my talk into these five sections. And um, the first, you, you might say, well, why am I bothering with why does AMR matter? Because uh, I'm sure we all know it does matter. But specifically, what I want to do is just to give you four hard hitting messages about why AMR does really matter. Before we get to those four messages, let's just look at some current rather disturbing epidemiology. And this is specifically about the numbers uh, and indeed rate of carbapenemase producing gram negative positive samples that are submitted um, to uh, the, the reference laboratory in Collindale. And you can see from the graph an inexorable rise over the course of the last three years um, in these uh, positive samples, whether they be from all sites or just from um, sterile sites. Uh, so things are getting worse. We also know from the map on the left hand side that the geography of these um, samples and these organisms varies. So we see that the northwest has a particular um, problem with carbapenemase producing gram negative um, uh, infections and colonizers. Uh, and indeed, if you look at quant qualitatively what makes up those positives, you'll see differences as we move across the country. And again, honing in on the Northwest, you'll see uh, a, 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 a marked preponderance of KPC positive um, samples, um, unlike many other parts of the uh, of the country. So here's my first hard hitting fact. We already know that over a million people died from AMR in 2019. Second fact, that figure is estimated to become 50 million if we don't reverse the current trends and that 50 million deaths globally will actually outnumber cancer deaths by 2050 if we don't do anything to reverse the trend. So that's too high. The third of the data here uh, showing the effects of increasing resistance to the antibiotics that we use for surgical prophylaxis. And you can see particularly in types of um, uh, surgery associated with contamination, frequent risk of contamination, namely colorectal surgery, the effects in terms, are, are in terms of additional deaths on a 10, 30, 70 or 100 percent increase in resistance are very marked. And this isn't just conjecture. We're already seeing increasing levels of resistance to coamoxiclav one of the most frequently used antibiotics for surgical prophylaxis. So that's three. Fourth, these are very new data just been published and very stark. Average global life expectancy will fall by nearly two years over the next decade because of antimicrobial resistance. If that doesn't make the politicians wake up and, uh, and, and carry out the much needed actions, nothing will. But actually it's not just politicians, of course, it's all of us that need to maximize our effort. So I want to, having framed the nature of the problem, I want to start with talking about diagnosis rather than guesswork. We know that the great majority of antibiotic prescriptions are made on an empirical basis, guesswork. OK, professional guesswork, but guesswork. 
If we go back to Lord Jim O'Neill's report in 2016, this is a direct quote from one of the 10 recommendations that Jim O'Neill came up with about the need to promote new rapid diagnostics. And he said, it's not acceptable that much of the technology used to inform the prescription of important medicines like antibiotics has not evolved substantially in more than 140 years. Simple question, in the eight years since this hard hitting statement was written, how much progress have we made? I think we've made some, including during the pandemic, ironically, where our eyes were opened about how rapid diagnosis can make a real difference, but I don't think we've made enough. What we have done is um, set up a, a longitude prize, um, uh, and you can see the details there, but that prize still has not yet been awarded and that ref and it should have been by now but it reflects the difficulty in actually making and proving that new tests can make a difference and there's some other schemes that i've mentioned there in the bullets which i'm not going to go into here that are trying to advance the cause of rapid just let me hone in, though, on a NICE review initially in 2016, which looked at the potential role of rapid diagnostic tests for bloodstream infections caused by bacteria or fungi. Essentially, that concluded that there was no or only marginal advantages of using the existent rapid diagnostic methods in the context of positive blood cultures. That was a 2016 review. In 2020, NICE found nothing new that affects the recommendations in, that, in their guidance. So again, four years since the Jim O'Neill hard-hitting statement, no tangible progress. Then the pandemic hit, and I'm saying that we need to build on the momentum that came from the pandemic. And in particular, if you think about laboratory-based diagnostics, an example in the top left here, doesn't matter what it is, but PCR-based technology versus a rapid diagnostic in the bottom right, clearly one might be more accurate than the other, but which can make the most difference? And I, and I think we need to exploit rapid, accurate as possible diagnostics to stop the guesswork involved in 80% are empirical. Once we start an antibiotic, difficult to stop and, and so on. I, I've coloured in red here the key parts of studying diagnostics. You know, is an infection present, yes or no? I think that's probably the most telling thing that diagnostics can give us, as opposed to a diagnostic that says whether antibiotic resistance is present. Because if we reduce antibiotic prescri prescribing en masse, we can probably make more of, a, of, of an impact globally than honing in using diagnostics to hone in on whether resistance is present or not. And we need urgent data about the true clinical predictive value of tests, their clinical utility, and of course, I want to move on to say something about the value of antibiotics. Here, the UK has been a world leader, and that is to the credit of NICE and NHS England, who came up with this, sometimes referred to this Netflix subscription model, where, where we um, awarded two contracts for um, Cefridurocol and um, for Keftazidine, Avibactam. Uh, and, and those contracts um, are payments that are devoid of the volume of use of those antibiotics. 
How did those contracts come about? Well, they, they had to count the value of the antibiotics and make an award accordingly. The problem with that system, though, is that you need extremely complex, time-consuming models at the moment to determine the value of antibiotics and therefore their, their contract value for a scheme. So the models break down antibiotics into the so-called steady principles, the value of antibiotics into steady principles, the spectrum, transmission, the enablement value, diversity value, and the insurance value. And these are, are, are briefly um, explained here. I'm not going to go into these in detail, but you can imagine that going through each of these and reviewing the data is very time consuming. And indeed, this report, which was the basis for carrying out this modeling work based on the steady principles, is 174 pages long. That's the complexity of the task at hand. And moving forwards, as we are going to move forwards in this space of awarding volume divor divorced contracts for antibiotics based on their value, we need a And the other system, the, the system two version, will be a scoring system. And there was um, a consultation based on this at the, at the tail end of, of last year. The announcement of the final scoring system has not yet been made, but I understand this is imminent. And um, it'll be based on the categories on the right hand side um, and points scored by each product according to preset questions within each of these categories. And what it's hoped is that this approach will drive the evidence base that new antibiotics come to, come to the market with so that they can be scored, their value measured accurately. Moving on to why diversity matters. And this is something that I've been an advocate for for a long time, for, for well over a decade. In, indeed, in the existent UK National Action Plan to tackle antimicrobial resistance, there's a specific section that highlights the potential value of increasing the diversity of prescribed antibiotics. Although, as the red highlighted text shows, the evidence base is at, at present, or at least it, when this report was written, was still insufficient to promote this approach um, uh, uh, to a great extent. Now, that's the existing uh, National Action Plan. The new National Action, Action Plan that will take us beyond the, for the five years beyond this current year has is about to be launched. I can't, I'm not allowed to talk about the detail in there, but um, hopefully uh, we will see in due course that um, issues such as this and diagnostics and so on will get a much greater attention in the new National Action Plan. But let's just stick with diversity for a few. And th these are data um, from uh, a review, uh, quite an old review now, 10 years old. But what this uh, review showed is an, a systematic um, review, a meta-analysis of 11 studies. And the 11 studies are summarized in, in the list on the right-hand side. But essentially what these, um, uh, this review showed was that there was a clear, significant relationship between the amount of resistance present and the effectiveness of the intervention, which was switching prescribing, often cycling, 
um, using different antibiotics rather than the one or ones that have been implicated in the specific resistances um, that, that, that were in these individual studies. But the point here is that if you make an intervention based on switching prescribing early when resistance is low, the prevalence is low, you have more of an effect. So at low levels of baseline resistance, clinical cycling, which is a, a term I, say, I take it to mean actually judiciously choosing which antibiotics can be can be prescribed rather than relying on one or only two or three antibiotics which are prescribed again and again and again. That can make a distant, a, di a significant difference to the prevalence of resistance. And yet, we all know these types of data that show that we rely very heavily, too heavily, I believe, still on a very small number of antibiotics. For example, the top 15 antibiotics in general practice and hospitals account for almost all, 98% and 88% of consumption, respectively. There are 66 uh, antibiotics prescribed across the NHS, approximately different ones, and yet we rely very heavily on less than a quarter of those. This is an international guideline from, uh, from the IDSA uh, about the management of ventilator-associated pneumonia. And I put this, this example up to show the numbers of different choices of antibiotics in these evidence-based guidelines. And I've highlighted the word or. If you contrast a table like that based on evidence, with a typical antibiotic policy, indeed the antibiotic policy in my own hospital, the numbers of appearance of the word or is substantially reduced, again, outlined in red here. And this is to emphasize the fact that our policies drive lack of choice, lack of diversity of, of prescribing. And that means they're driving resistance. If you over wear, over wash your favorite t-shirt, your favorite antibiotic, it wears. And there's lots of ways of delivering uh, diverse pr prescribing, but we need more evidence as to which of these are the most effective. Of course, if we've got experts, lots of experts available, we can drive diverse prescribing, but there aren't enough people to do that. So we're going to need, I believe, computer assisted decision making, etc. smarter ways of driving diverse prescribing. And just to give you a very simple example, imagine you go and do an antibiotic ward round um, on the ITU and there are four patients with uh, query ventilator associated pneumonia. Why should we prescribe the same antibiotic that it says in the, in the hospital guideline to each of those four patients and so drive selection pressure for resistance to that antibiotic and possibly to other ones. Instead, why can't we prescribe four or three different antibiotics according, of course, to the, to the, um, to the merits of each case based on evidence-based evidence guidelines? There's no reason why we can't move from our current homogenous prescribing to a more carefully selected heterogeneous prescribing to minimize antibiotic selective. So I've got 30 seconds left. I missed. Well, the answer's lots. I've not talked about um, optimizing duration, dose, about de-escalating, um, about the extended use of antibiotics. Is it right we should be prescribing macrolides to people to increase gut motility Surely 
that's in, in, in ITU scenarios, surely we should be using other drugs, other approaches, rather than risking resistance selection. And so this is my final slide to leave you with, just to emphasize the now large evidence base that, that shows that shorter duration of antibiotics is as good as longer duration. And of course, shorter duration will be associated with less selection pressure for resistance. Yes, there are some exceptions there in the table on the right hand side, but we should be acting upon the evidence that's available. Thank you for listening.